The regular meeting of the Minneapolis Police Conduct Oversight Commission will now begin. Good evening, my name is Abigail Sarah. I am the chair of the Police Conduct Oversight Commission and I'm gonna call this meeting for December 14th, 2021 to order. As we begin, I will note for the record that this meeting has remote participation by members of the city council and city staff as authorized under Minnesota statutes, section 13D.021 due to declared public health emergency. The city will be recording and posting this meeting to the city's website and YouTube channel as a means of increasing public access and transparency. This meeting is public and subject to open meeting law. At this time, I will ask the clerk to call roll so we can verify quorum for this meeting. Commissioner Crockett is absent. Commissioner McGuire. Present. Commissioner Pino is absent. Commissioner Sylvester. Here. Vice Chair Sparks. Present. Chair Sarah. Present. There are four members present. Let the record reflect that we have quorum. Next, we'll proceed to our agenda, a copy of which is, oops, excuse me. Um, next, we will move to adoption of the agenda and acceptance of the minutes. Does anyone move to adopt the agenda and accept the minutes? Uh, Vice Chair Sparks, I'll move to adopt the agenda and the minutes. Bef uh, before I second the motion, um, Chair Sarah, I was going to ask if I could make an addition or if we can wait till a later meeting about engage the question about engaging an MJF volunteer. Um, I'm also uh, okay waiting till January if you thought it was more appropriate for another meeting. I do have it on the agenda. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I thought I didn't see it. It's it's only one line item. I didn't have any data to include okay. with it, so I think okay. it's sort of, yeah. I sorry, I missed that. Then I second hey, the no motion. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. Um, all right. May I, uh, uh, will the clerk please call roll? Commissioner McGuire. Aye. Commissioner Sylvester. Aye. Chair Sparks. Our Vice Aye. Chair Sparks. Aye. Chair Sarah. Aye. There are four ayes. That motion carries and the agenda is adopted and the minutes for the November meeting are accepted. Next, I would like to recognize Interim Civil Rights Director Alberta Gillespie. Thank you so much for joining us, Director Gillespie. Please take the floor and introduce yourself. Well, thank you, Chair Sarah, for um, for allowing me to be on the agenda this evening. As has been said, I am the current interim director for the Department of Civil Rights, and so I have been in this position for about four and a half weeks now. And I want to say your chair has been very gracious and welcomed me to me to my new role. So I certainly appreciate that. Uh, prior to uh, being in this role, I actually did work with the city in an enterprise wide role as the outreach. Uh, coordinator and uh, director for the 2020 census initiative for the city of Minneapolis. And so yay for us. We did an excellent job. We got people counted. We saved to help save that uh, congressional seat. So good work, good work. Um, so I've been able to work in, uh, and with the majority of the departments in the city, and I've also done a lot of work within the community as well. So I'm excited, as I mentioned to your chair, about working with you on the, these important issues that are before us as a community. I know you've done some really great work and you asked the really hard questions, which we all want, we need to do. And so I am looking forward to um, just working with each and every one of you. So thank you for the time on the agenda. I'm going to Shut my my camera off and learn and listen. Terrific. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. OK, the next order of business is a discussion of medical related training in MPD, and I'd like to recognize our guest speaker, Dr. Nicholas Simpson from HCMC. Dr. Simpson, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your time. And uh, it's just worth noting that HCMC is the exclusive partner with the Minneapolis Police Department that provides medical related advice and training. And so we're really grateful for your partnership and collaboration. Would you like to offer any remarks or uh, give a presentation to our commission tonight? Yeah, I do have some things to, to share. So thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it very much. Um, I'll take a few minutes and kind of update the group on some ways that I think HHS and Hennepin EMS um, interact with our public safety partners and how that may have changed over 
the last even few years. <clears throat> um, we have many public safety partners, as you guys know, um, that includes a number of law enforcement agencies, and I know you guys are specifically interested in MPD. So we interface with MPD uh, in the field while caring for our patients. Uh, and we also, through the education that uh, Chair Sarah mentioned. Um, so to start, I know an important piece to discuss is uh, the term excited delirium syndrome. And I know this is a term, uh, as, as you guys have discussed, uh, that terminology is not recognized as a diagnosis by the AMA, APA, or WHO. Um, it has become increasingly clear that excited delirium syndrome has become associated with a strong bias, and to many groups, it is a, a very triggering term. Uh, therefore, uh, HHS and Hennepin EMS have committed to no longer use this terminology in our practice or in our education. And uh, I don't know if, uh, if this has come up in other discussions, but um, Commissioner Sylvester um, may have shared some information about an email that we sent out to everybody explaining that, that it is not a helpful term anymore. It seems to cause, you know, uh, cause issues. And so for that reason, we are not using that term anymore. Um, I do think it's important to note that any big change like that, especially with medical nomenclature, will take some time to fully see its way through. <clears throat> Currently, this term is found in many textbooks, including pre-hospital textbooks. And so that is something not in our control. However, we are not unique in wanting to get away from that terminology. Uh, we've seen other terms in medicine that have been attributed to, uh, for example, there's uh, one particular kind of uh, pulmonary disease that um, is associated with a uh, former Nazi physician, that, and that term has been changed to be more descriptive, and that's that's kind of our push here, is to, to be more descriptive in our terminology that we use. Um, all that said, the terminology is important and words matter. Um, we cannot deny the physiology of a person who's exerting themselves will create a metabolic acidosis. And so this is where I think the, the medical piece is, is quite important. Now, this is why, uh, you know, sprinters will measure their lactate on the side of the track to see how hard they're exerting themselves with the finger stick. And so we also have to recognize that due to a number of things such as medical emergencies, substance use, or psychiatric emergencies, people may lose that intrinsic mechanism, excuse me, mechanism to force their body to rest. And I think, you know, if, if I were to go outside right now and just sprint as hard as I could, eventually I'm gonna stop. Uh, and if someone loses that intrinsic mechanism, it, it can be quite dangerous. Um, can you guys hear me okay? I just got a bad network quality. Yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> so people who are experiencing experiencing a metabolic acidosis, whether it's from exertion or diabetic ketoacidosis, rely very heavily on that respiratory compensation, which is breathing very, very heavily so that they can blow off their CO2 and maintain their pH within a physiologic range. And so the consequence of inadequate respirations or inadequate compensation is that they will get increasingly acidotic and ultimately the risk is, is death there. And so most commonly that is shown as a PEA arrest or uh, pulseless electrical activity. And the unfortunate piece about that is when someone is that sick from acidosis, it is often very difficult, if not impossible, to successfully resuscitate them back. And so we teach, and it's very important for our law enforcement partners to understand that someone who's experiencing a crisis this way, without any other interventions, if, if the only action is restraint, it does make that metabolic acidosis worse and can potentially lead to people's death. And that is what we don't want. And that's why that partnership with law enforcement, as you guys have spoken about, is very important. And so <clears throat> if someone is exerting themselves and may have lost that intrinsic check, one of the safest things that we can use in a situation like that is a medication to treat that agitation if the person can't be you know, de-escalated with verbal means or, or is you know, forced to engage in a physical interaction with someone. And, and that may be, and we see this from time to time where people are uh, running into traffic. And so the, we can't 
not restrain someone who's running into traffic because that would put the public and them at further danger. Uh, but we can't just restrain them either. It has to be a, a coordinated effort with law enforcement and with healthcare professionals. And so I can tell you guys recently I looked on the NAEMSP website, which is the National Association of EMS Physician website. And right at the top, there's a, a piece about EMS and law enforcement. And, and it's short, so I'll read it to you. It says that EMS and law enforcement officers must rely on distinct yet complementary skill sets in such critical and rapidly changing situations. Law enforcement officers rely on EMS for medical assessment and transport to a hospital when deemed necessary. And EMS will rely on law enforcement officers to provide scene safety, to mitigate threats to EMS clinicians, and to allow safe medical evaluation in uncertain and often unfamiliar environments. And so it's a, it can be a, a complicated piece, but we, we do need to work together, but within our own specialties out there. So to that piece, I want to share with you guys that HHS and Hennepin EMS are committed to increasing and improving our medical education to NPD and all law enforcement agencies. Regarding that terminology, again, our, our EMS physicians who oversee that specific training have spent a lot of time over the last year going through and updating the materials. I know that uh, Chair Sarah and I have spoken about some of the training materials you guys have seen in the past. And we really want to ensure very accurate and objective terminology. And so uh, getting rid of uh, less descriptive terms and using things like opioid use disorder, alcohol use disorder, I think that is a more objective way so that we can work to decrease those preconceived notions that may come with um, when people are diagnosed or, or have those issues. And so we really want to ensure that the medical aspects are being emphasized because that that is what our focus is. Um, this is a significant shift. I think when a law enforcement officer approaches a situation and they are uh, encountering an individual who is in a medical emergency, and I think <clears throat> there's a, a real tangible shift people see when <clears throat> You encounter someone having a medical emergency versus someone who you think may be willfully breaking the law. And I think that is what our education really tries to push is that there is a, a, a way for those folks to identify when there may be a medical emergency and to try and call EMS early. Historically, law enforcement training is focused on CPR, on hemorrhage control, and naloxone. And we're trying to help them identify times when people may be experiencing a, a medical or psychiatric crisis so that we can be involved early. So to that end, we are committed to strengthening those relationships so that we can better serve our community and those residents in that community. And then the last piece I want to say, and I'll open it up to questions and discussion, is that uh, we are also committed to increased feedback from the community. As an example, within this last year, HHS and Hennepin EMS started our EMS advisory group so that we can have better dialogue with our community members and community leaders. And that's something that's been uh, a great addition so that we can discuss uh, better understanding of what our, our communities that we serve see, experience, and, and, uh, and feel. And so um, also to that, you know, I think it's, it's really been kind of a theme of the work we've done over the last year um, within, you know, Hennepin EMS leadership and with HHS to try and increase that dialogue and that communication between the community uh, that we serve and, and our EMS group, which is kind of squarely in the middle of healthcare, public health, and public safety. And we kind of have to operate in all those worlds. Um, so, you know, with that, it's also been helpful to engage in uh, with our elected officials, with community leaders, so that they can better understand uh, the work that we're doing and the challenges being faced in those, those arenas as well. And so we've had a number of elected officials out. We recently had Vice Chair Sparks out. Um, and so that's, I think it's been a really, really nice way to increase some of that dialogue so that we can have really more robust discussions and have a better understanding. And with that, I will pause and open for discussion, feedback, comments, questions, concerns, all that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Simpson. I'm going to open it up to commissioners for public, excuse me, for questions and comments, and then I will um, allow the public to ask questions as well. Commissioners, um, either physically raise your hand or do the thing and let me know if you'd like to be recognized.
Commissioner McGuire. Any questions? I, yeah, thank you, uh, Chair Sarah. I just I'm, I apologize if this is already in the presentation somewhere, um, but I was just wondering, have you seen a market increase in EMS services being present at um, or being called? After doing presentations, have you seen a link between, you know, your basically the ability to have medical in intervention when it's appropriate thanks to these presentations? How has that been going? Yeah, I will admit I have not looked at data. I can tell you all calls have gone up over the last few years. Um, three years ago, we were going on about 74,000 calls a year. Last year was about 86 and this year around pace to exceed 94. And so it's I think it would be difficult to say, and I, and I don't want to lie to you, so I don't know offhand if we've seen proportional increases. I can tell you we've seen proportional increases in um, not so much shootings and stabbings, which I would have expected, uh, but we have seen year over year the last few years uh, calls that the primary issue seems to be alcohol and substance related has been about 13%, and then this year it jumped to about 24 so I think that that is one thing that we've seen a market increase in and Commissioner Sylvester may have relayed some of those things to you guys firsthand, but I think that uh, I can't speak to the law enforcement piece, but I can speak to, to that piece offhand. Thank you. That's all. Vice Chair Sparks. Hello. Uh, first, uh, as uh, I just wanted to say that as Dr. Uh, Simpson mentioned, um, he I, I did the uh, EMS ride along uh, a couple weeks ago, and Dr. Simpson was uh, gracious enough to be with me all night and kind of show me how things are done. So thanks again, Dr. Simpson, for your uh, assistance with that and for spending all that time with me. I'm sure it wasn't easy. Um, Absolutely, I, that's great. <laughs> uh, but I do want to say. Um, it was uh, it was a it was a busy night um, when I went out for the ride along and I I mean I I really learned a lot I have a profoundly new and different understanding of how uh, EMS uh, works in Minneapolis and how um, uh, the different uh, units coordinate together fire uh, medical and police. Um, it's profoundly new and different, and I also have a profoundly new and different respect for the uh, the hard work involved and the split decisions and uh, everything else involved. I didn't fully appreciate it until I saw it uh, up close and personal and people saving lives right in front of me. It was a very, very eye-opening experience, and I would really encourage uh, my fellow commissioners to uh, to take advantage of the, the program that HCMC is offering and do a ride-along as well if you if you can swing it, um, it was extremely educational. Uh, something that'll probably stay with me for the rest of my life. Thank you. Well, um, I'm going to recognize myself, Chair Sarah. Uh, I'd just like to offer some background about why I put it on the agenda and invited Dr. Simpson to be here. Um, my understanding is that HCMC has been sort of the partner for medical related advice for quite some time, but the relationship is you know, sort of changed over time. And at one point they were very engaged and did tons of trainings and it sort of went down. And um, I think uh, I think at this point it it's like a very, it's much less uh, interaction than it used to be. And uh, I think this is a good opportunity, probably the perfect moment and time to go back to that very strong relationship and have a greater presence between the two agencies. And so I'm grateful that HEMC has opened their doors and invited me to, con uh, you know, to kind of talk about that. And one thing we should consider as a commission, or I would like us to consider as a commission, is recommending an increased participation, you know, via the contract, I suppose, with HCMC and their medical related advice. Um, Dr. Simpson did mention excited delirium and Dr. Simpson, if I could ask you a question, you know, you said your agency is moving away from using that terminology. I'm wondering though, is there going to be, will there be substantive, substantive changes to the training and what you're looking at as well? Because I think if you look at the training and you took out the term excited delirium and you inserted, um, metabolic acidosis, if that's the term I'm understanding. You know, even if you put in a more descriptive term that is more medically accurate, I, I think there were still some subs, substantive problems. Um, 
which is sometimes just an issue of translation of taking medical information and giving it to non medical professionals. And I can attest to that because I'm reading this as a non medical professional, so I sort of know how I receive this information. Um, could you speak to that point if you don't mind? Yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. So it is. So I think to your point, the terminology is important that we get away from that. And, and just to acknowledge that that words do matter quite a great deal. Um, that said, I, I think what excited delirium has become, it seems, and you guys have a, a different perspective and maybe can correct me or disagree with me. Uh, it seems to be this catch all where you know when we when we originally intended for it to be used for a medical emergency it was this is a medical emergency get you know ems on the way as soon as possible uh it seems to have become something very different and it seems to have been associated with bias and dehumanization and that is not what we want at all i think it's it's deeper than just changing the terminology but it is it is important that we don't completely separate you know someone who is encountered by law enforcement that may be having a crisis and um, i think i may have shared with with one or two of you that you know one of the trainings that we do for other law enforcement agencies with you know scenario based training is they encounter somebody who's you know the call is there's somebody going through cars trying to break into cars and um, what the scenario actually is, is somebody who's having a diabetic emergency and hypoglycemic and, and therefore confused. And so I think getting away from the terminology excited delirium and having a more, a more sophisticated discussion about identifying a medical emergency and then not just lumping everybody into this, you know, worst case scenario, but trying to have different degrees of you know, there are some people that due to a number of different crises that are honestly impossible to differentiate right up front, um, maybe, you know, in a place where they're hard to de-escalate verbally, they're, they're impossible to de-escalate verbally. Um, they may be in a place where they, they do need that acute medical intervention. Uh, but, you know, how do we communicate that someone's having a medical emergency without saying, you know, there's this catch all criteria or this catch all term, um, but we just really need to be more, I think, thoughtful about how we engage, you know, the two different groups, which is, I think it's just, it, it's a very, it's a different change in, uh, it's a shift in how we approach the problem instead of just the shift in the terminology, if that makes sense. It does, thank you. And, uh, you know, you and I have discussed how these changes won't take place overnight, and so it's going to be important for all of us to continue to work together. And, um, you know, maybe the, maybe the next training we present, even that won't be perfect, and even that will need to be amended. You know, I think it's, it's going to be a process, and so I'm glad we're having this conversation. Um, we do have an opportunity here, a couple of opportunities, and I'd just like to share that, um, the commander of training, Commander Darcy Horn, has met with me and the director of medical, I think it's called medical related training within the MPD, uh, Officer Nicole McKenzie has also met with me. And the new medical support division is brand new in the fall of 2020. It didn't exist before then. I think that is a terrific addition. I think that's really going to improve training moving forward. I think it already has, for example, for the first time now, there is a standalone training specifically on positional asphyxiation and what to do, which is essentially just roll the person over. I mean, it's like a three minute video, but I think it's you know informative and important to call that out. So I think we have an opportunity and a vehicle in place to increase these trainings and make them better and tailor them to the law enforcement officer who's not the EMS person, you know, it's different roles. And I see that Commissioner Sylvester has his hand up. Would you like to be recognized, Commissioner Sylvester? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, full disclosure for the record, uh, Dr. Simpson is my medical director at uh, head of an EMS. Um, I, to Commissioner McGuire's point um, or question earlier, anecdotally, I would say um, that I have seen professionally a significant increase in law enforcement in Minneapolis um, call for EMS um, 
essentially, let's say just in case, right? Just to just to just to cover themselves, just to put in their report, whatever you know, EMS arrived, just to get on that body camera. The paramedics arrived, and paramedics did an assessment that's now recorded on a body camera for everybody to see, um, which is incredibly valuable. So that um, anecdotally, I can say that that um, that shift is probably happening. Um, and the key thing that I want to emphasize that I'm really excited that Dr. Simpson talked about tonight is just simply like that idea of call early and often, right? Like putting in people's heads to always call us early, get us involved early, even before you arrive on the scene. If the notes that you're getting in this call seem a little fishy to you, maybe this is something that you've seen before. Maybe you know this person. Maybe this is something that just doesn't sit right with you. Maybe this is medical. Let's just get the paramedics in route early. Um, that's a cultural shift. That's a fundamental cultural shift in the way people have done their jobs in some cases for 20 years. And, you know, that, that does take time. Um, and I'm, you know, putting my professional hat back on, I'm really excited to be a part of an organization that's, um, I think maybe a little unwillingly after the murder of George Floyd being thrust into a national position to be a leader in this space. Right. But, um, you know, we're blessed at HCMC and Hennepin EMS to be leaders in a lot of different spaces. And so this is a space that we can be a leader in nationally is helping to shift um, this understanding. And I'm, I'm as a citizen of Minneapolis, as a commissioner, and as a professional, I'm, I'm really excited to be really kind of at the center of that shift. Yeah, can Thank I, you. Can I echo Mr. Sylvester's words a little bit? I think, you know, being at at the epicenter of this world changing event is not anything that I think any of us wanted. Uh, that said, uh, to, to Commissioner Sylvester's point, I think it has given us untold opportunities to, to really lead the way, uh, even though we didn't expect it. Um, and it is, you know, the whole, the whole last year and a half has been, I think, fairly painful for all of us, but I think it is, it is one that we can grow from, and if we use this time in a productive way, I think we can really become better because of that. Thank you, I agree. And I would like the public to have a chance to ask Dr. Simpson any questions. Um, I'm going to open it up for public comment. Please press star six to unmute yourself, star six. If you have any comments or questions for our speaker, he does have a time limit this evening and he will need to leave. Hello, uh, this is uh, Dave Bicking and I appreciate your opening this up and uh, this is a very important conversation. Um, I'm just curious and uh, wondering the, with the concerns there's been that excited delirium is something that uh, is a somewhat more recent um, you know, diagnosis or term, and um, has seemed to be correspond quite closely to um, engagement with law enforcement, and in particular, um, a very close um, correlation between the use of tasers and the diagnosis of excited delirium, and, and particularly even more so when that led to death. So. I'm wondering uh, with the new terminology or the new medical understanding or whatever that may be brought to this here, um, to what extent is this still correlated with law enforcement engagement or uh, specifically uh, the use of tasers? Because that's uh, a large part of what ex gave excited delirium sort of a, a bad name, at least among activists and uh, uh, spreading more widely after that. Uh, thank you. Sure. So I can I can start by saying I'm not a law enforcement officer. And I'm not trained in use of tasers or in their use of force. So I I can't speak to that. I I think what I can speak to is when EMS encounter someone simultaneously with law enforcement. And so I think one of the things that is maybe not totally clear to to everyone in the lay public is that you know not every call that ends up with someone in a behavioral crisis or psychiatric emergency starts out that way from the beginning of the 911 call and so you know it may start as uh, hey there's somebody in my backyard they're trying to get in the house <clears throat> 
or hey, there's somebody breaking things in the street. And so that often will start as a law enforcement call only, and EMS will potentially be added later. And so, you know, if if someone is, you know, if, if I go out into the street right now and I start smashing cars, law enforcement's going to get there. And if I interact as they expect, they're probably not going to call EMS. However, uh, what we hope is if that behavior that people are exhibiting is, you know, doesn't make sense, if it seems unusual, if it seems like maybe there's something else going on that they call on, excuse me, they call EMS early. And that, that I think is the, the paradigm shift. And so because the training historically for law enforcement has, has been CPR, you know, overdose, uh, it has been hemorrhage control, uh, and then it has included agitation, which has come to mean largely excited delirium. And I think it's it's just not quite that simple. I think agitation as a large term is something that is is a is a more complex piece than just you know is does the person need CPR or not? That's I think easier for people to understand. Does a person need Narcan or not? Does a person need a tourniquet or not? Those things are. Clear, but I think agitation, the, the impetus needs to be, EMS needs to be here because something doesn't feel right. Something doesn't fit with what we expect, how we expect a person to behave. And so can't speak to the taser piece, but I think that's what we hope to gain with the revamp of education, with the updating, is to try and, and make it, one, it's not that simple as just excited delirium or not, but also it's, it's we need EMS there early and uh, yeah, I, I can't really touch the taser piece because I don't I don't know that. Thank you, Commissioner Sylvester. Did you have a response directly to that? I see your hand. No, I apologize. I still have my hand up. I apologize. <laughs> All right. If anyone else from the public would like to comment, uh, please press star six to unmute yourself. This is James Van Sloan. Um, Thank you for uh, uh, Commissioner uh, and Sarah. Um, I, my question is kind of piggybacking on the, on the previous question, and that's re, uh, re regarding data. Um, is the EMS um, documenting all uses of medication on these calls, and or is the MPD also uh, documenting the the use of the, the medication when that what it is occurred, so that we can at least keep track of how often it's happening, and again, then we could see if there is a correlation between this and use of tasers or, or other use of force? Absolutely, this one I can definitely speak to. So I can tell everyone here that our paramedics and uh, well, I'll just, I'll, speak, I'll stick to our paramedics, but in general EMS, and I can assure you with our paramedics, the only time our paramedics administer medications is when we are seeing patients. We don't administer medications for any other reason other than a patient that we are taking to the hospital and so i think that seems to be a point that has been uh, unclear i think in the past in the general public is that you know we we don't administer medications for any law enforcement purposes we administer medications when people have medical emergencies and uh, sometimes agitation can be one of those medical emergencies and so uh, there is never a time that i'm aware of where any EMS, specifically our EMS, uh, has administered medications and someone has gone anywhere other than the hospital, uh, such as they don't go to jail after this. They, this is not a tool of law enforcement. This is a medication to treat a problem, which at times is agitation. Same as we would give people aspirin for chest pain. Um, the law enforcement officers do not carry or administer any medications aside from naloxone. Uh, everything that, that we administer is for patients that are taken to the hospital. And I, and I believe that is documented within police reports when they call EMS and it will say EMS on scene or something, something like that. It, they might not mention the specific medication because they might not know, but I, there would be some sort of terminology in the police reports to answer can, Mr. Van Sloan. And every medication that we use every dose every route every single administration is documented within the the healthcare record that our paramedics use uh, and it is it is easy to search and so uh, we do review cases where uh, medications are used for agitation 
And so that is that's part of our workflow within our QA. Thank you, Commissioner McGuire. I think you started to answer my question um, because I, from personal experience, the police reports, because they don't know exactly what you're doing, might not accurately reflect what, what is happening on, on the medical end of things. And I'm just wondering if there's a way to get that data in aggregate or if that's a question for HDMC record keeping. Um, obviously, you can't get that personal data. So just was wondering because I think it would be more accurate from the medical end of things. Yeah, what data are you requesting? So if we're perhaps any times that EMS is called out to a scene where the police are and maybe they are taking someone with them and something like ketamine or something is administered, like how often that happens, um, something like that, because on an individual basis, I would imagine we would not have access to those records. Um, so just if we're looking for trends of what happens after EMS is called, kind of how would we know that? Yeah, I, I can tell you guys that from a data standpoint, the healthcare records that the medics use is is very easy for me to gather data and collect data on. The dispatch records, the dispatch information, which is in our, our CAD system, our computer aided dispatch, it's a separate system and often calls where law enforcement, fire and EMS go on are assigned different unique identifiers, even mm. though it may be the same call. And so it is challenging to try and link up all those calls as well as with aggregate data from the medical record. I, that is a hurdle that we talk about for you know, reimagining the response to mental health emergencies and, and a lot of other things. And there, it would be really nice to do that, but I don't know of a, an easy way to do that right now, aside from having some person review every call. Any other public comments? Please press star six to unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, Dr. Simpson, I know you have a time limit, so you're welcome to go. I think we have just a little bit more discussion with our group, so either stay on or, or do whatever your time allows. And thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. So I would like to recognize myself and say that um, one thing we can do as a commission tonight, commissioners, and I'd like your input on this, is discuss whether we'd like to recommend make a recommendation to the, the mayor and the police department to increase their medical related training. And I think that would require an increase in or an expansion of the, the existing contract with HCMC. Um, and perhaps if that is something we requested, perhaps, you know, request that there would be some sort of review process with that, either with, you know, the PCOC would be part of these conversations or, um, a health equity group would be part of the conversations or, you know, just kind of making sure that all the right people are at the table to do that. So I'd like to open the floor to the commission and see how folks feel about that or or how they think we should uh, move forward. Uh, if there's no uh, commissioner Spark, or vice chair Spark, excuse me. I just wanted to say, I mean, I mean, it, I feel like it seems like an appropriate recommendation. Um, John Sylvester has a much better perspective on this than I do, <laughs> but uh, much more informed perspective for sure. But I mean, yeah, I feel that that seems like a good way forward. Thank you. I mean, I'll say, um, Training is always in, in any public safety space, police, fire, EMS, training is always a good thing, right? Like training is always a good thing, period, right? Like any any additional training. Um, I think we have to keep in mind any recommendation that we make within this space that these guys are down like 250, 300 officers, right? From where they want to be. Um, and so the time that they would have to maybe dedicate to additional training, they might come back to us and say, we would love to do that. We would love to do one day a week on medical training, but we just don't have the um, we don't have the time to pull officers off the street in order to go do this training. I'm just saying like that 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 may come up. Um, and I guess I'll just circle back to the piece of, of kind of reorientating people towards 
thinking medical versus thinking enforcement, right? Um, any opportunity that we can do that within these with these professionals um, is a really good idea, right? Like any time that we can use their work time to help reorientate them towards a service model versus in some cases that enforcement model. Um, and it's, it's honestly, it's reflected in a lot of suburban police departments that I work with. Minnetonka, Eden Prairie, Hopkins, uh, Richfield, St. Anthony, whatever. A lot of these departments justify a lot of their staffing levels by sending their officers on almost every medical call we have. So when grandma falls down and can't get up, um, the Minnetonka Police Department and EMS will go pick up little old ladies, right? And when you have an expectation that your day is going to be spent, at least in part, picking up little old ladies, um, that's how you are orientated in your job, right? But if you work for a police department that does nothing other than medical rate of like assaults, right? Shootings and stabbings, overdoses, drug and alcohol related stuff, when that's the only medical training that you do, Right. I believe um, it orientates you towards those things. Right. And so um, it would be incredibly valuable, I think, for the Minneapolis Police Department to be reorientated towards that. I'm not saying that they have the time or the space or the energy or um, the staffing levels to pick up little old ladies, but there's a happy medium there that I think that we could um, encourage the city to to build in. Thank you. Well, with that, then I would like to make a motion um, that this commission make a recommendation to the mayor and the Minneapolis Police Department to um, consider uh, increased medical related training, particularly via the medical support division that already exists within the MPD. And, you know, I'm using a term like consider because as Commissioner Sylvester pointed out, they might not have the time or you know whatever but um i think this is the moment and i think it's important so those are my two cents any any discussion on that motion I, i'm not sure if we could uh this is commissioner mcguire we could make a push if we are actually going to see the hiring of so many new officers uh, i think a ideal time to include such training and maybe is in their initial training these other people are going to have the time to sit through it um so at least make it at least a stronger push for any new officers and their training to go to to kind of have these newer trainings yeah it's, it's a good point i read uh somewhere maybe it was the strip i can't remember but there was a the hiring this uh, in 2022 for MPD was expected to be something like 160 new officers. They had budget and and so forth for uh, enough classes to get something like that number of new officers. So maybe it, it, in that regard, it's probably a good time, right? Like uh, Commissioner McGuire said. Thank you. I think without anyone else raising their hand, I think we're ready for a vote then. If the clerk would please call roll on that motion. Commissioner McGuire. Aye. Commissioner Sylvester. Aye. Vice Chair Sparks. Aye. Chair Sarah. Aye. There are four ayes. That motion carries and as chair, I will um, convey that information to the mayor and the MPD. And that brings us uh, for our next item. Commander Darcy Horn will give us an update regarding the MPD field training officer program and I, I apologize we're uh we're later than i promised you we would be commander horn um thank you for being here and commander horn is uh commander of training so uh it's timely <laughs> i'm glad you were actually here for that presentation so please take it away commander horn uh thank you chair sarah um thank you for having me today uh it was um an interesting conversation so i appreciate being able to listen to that i'm happy to be here this evening to talk to the commission about the special project with the field training program with the mpd um, as you are aware the city audit committee uh, did a study on it and it's a final project and made some recommendations and we came back with some um, plans of our own and I'm happy to report on the progress of that. So as the um, 
as the project mentioned, there were about four issues that were identified, um, particularly the uh, staffing in the structure and the um, developing manuals and for both the uh, trainers and the new officers for the field training coordinators and the precinct supervisors. So encompassing um, increased communication uh, for sure. And establishing quarterly training and increased communication plans again and to look at the oversight in selecting the field training officers. So um, if unless there's something I can just jump right into, um, I guess in the beginning with the selection of the field training officers and we ask for a recommendation from a current supervisor and then the uh, precinct inspector is aware of that and that officer candidate would be interviewed by individuals in the training division and then that officer is their history in internal affairs is checked as well for any open cases or what any patterns or practices in previous cases before um, being selected. So that um, those checks as well for the um, internal affairs process are, are going to be continually checked. So there's a system in place now where internal affairs will alert the training division that a new case has um, opened up. And so then we can communicate that to the uh, supervisors at the precinct and put this training officer on what we call a pause until that um, uh, incident has been fully investigated. And then it is the decision of the chief or designee, perhaps the um, deputy chief of professional standards, if that pause will be continued or if that officer can um, be a field training officer. And as uh, we continue with the program, we will have a uh, three day uh, field training school and um, course and as well as periodic trainings then quarterly through the year, um, which would help again with uh, communication and expectations, um, consistency in, in grading and scoring, um, help with adult learning and, and problem solving and um, as well as um, creating, helping create performance plans and um, certain programs like that that uh, could be helped, um, helpful for the officers in training. Uh, we also have purchased a records management system that will help with um, tracking of our officers in training and it's just starting. We're just training our, our FTOs on it now. So um, we will begin using it in December. So it, it's pretty exciting and um, really will help with the reporting issues that we in training um, will be able to utilize. So um, we are pleased with with the uh, progress that we're making on uh, the FTO program and um, we're happy to I'm happy to take questions and um, if anyone has any. Thank you. I'll st uh, thank you, Commander Horn. I'll start with the commission. Commissioners, uh, any questions or comments for Commander Horn? Uh, I'll recognize myself, Chair Sarah. Um, it, you mentioned there were some new manuals. Are there those available? Are they being written? Kind of where are they in that process? They have been written and they're currently under review at uh, the okay. Chief's. Thank you. Uh, any other commissioners, questions or comments? Uh, Commissioner Sylvester. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for being here with us. I really appreciate it. Um, are you with so many potential new 
recruits this year or next year? Are you having difficulty finding field training officers? Are you finding difficulty having people come forward and raise their hand? I mean, this seems, I mean, I, I do this on a regular basis at my agency and I, it's a, it's a tremendous responsibility. Are you having difficulty finding people or are people stepping up for you? People are stepping up, which, which is great to see. Um, certainly as a whole, as you mentioned earlier, we are at a, um, a crisis with our staffing levels. So of course, just relative, we're down FTOs, but I am pleased with the, um, the folks that have agreed and recognized the importance of this role and they have stepped up. So that is, that is good to see. We, uh, Commander Horn, we did receive one public comment just today um, uh, from a former officer who talked about um, uh, sort of shadow banning or maybe blacklisting of individual officers from being advanced to being an FTO, um, kind of in an act of retaliation or even just a personality conflict or something like that. Um, is there something about the new program, the new training that would prevent that kind of thing? Is there like a check and balance that would provide, you know, just like a retaliation from a supervisor or something? Um, the decision to be promoted to a field training officer ultimately is with the chief's office and um, the chief and the deputy chief of professional standards. And that decision is based on a totality of work performance and evaluations in the discipline hearing or a discipline history and um, the number of disciplines or the extent of it and the time that has happened from it. So um, those are the de those decisions are made at the chief's level based on that. Thank you. And I had one sort of related question. Um, Derek Chauvin was a field training officer, um, and he had a number of incidents of excessive force that were actually not disciplined. So, I mean, that brings up a couple of questions. One is, um, what happens if you're engaging in misconduct or you know you have some problems, but you're not being disciplined? Would that still be sort of captured? Question one, and then question two is, is there a is there a mechanism to prevent officers who are you know thumpers or engaging in a lot of excessive force? Is that like a ban from being a field training officer? That is a great question, and that is um, at the discretion of the chief's office and the new mechanism in place, which I believe would catch incidents incidents like that where we have an officer with a you know, a number of complaints. I wouldn't know what those complaints are. No one in training would know what those complaints are, but internal affairs gets the names. They they get when they get the complaint in or the notification, they have our list of uh, field training officers and they can speak with the deputy chief of professional standards and the chief and they can discuss what is appropriate and they will let us know if someone needs to be paused or removed from that list. And that is a new step that has been um, added to this. So I think that is um, a positive step forward. Thank you. Commissioner Sylvester. I, thank you so much. Commander, is there um, is there any ambulance ride time built into this um, into the training structure for new recruits? I don't believe there's an ambulance ride time, but there is a a tour with an ambulance, uh, you know, a walk around so they can um, familiarization. Recognizing myself, Chair Sarah, uh, Commander Horn related um, one one part of the public comment was recommending um, patrol experience for individuals who are going to be field training officers because the patrol, as I understand it, not law enforcement, Patrol is the person who's the cop who's actually on the street and kind of, you know, taking calls within the community, sort of like a ride along with with the ambulance. Um, are there any sort of standards or if it's not a hard requirement, like a preferred requirement or something of that nature that would, you know, have 
uh, put a value on patrol experience or put a value on ability to de-escalate or you know the kind of like characteristics that we would think would be beneficial yeah absolutely we're looking for individuals who want to train um, we're looking for individuals who competently and willingly want to teach and are able to find different ways to help these officers in training and help them police our neighborhoods and and try to make safer environments and to model and to mentor so not only are we looking for individuals who can competently train on the correct policies and procedures procedures, but also do it in a way that is procedurally just. So we're looking for that well-rounded individual. Thank you. I am going to open it up for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to ask any questions or make a comment, please press star six to unmute yourself. Star six to unmute yourself. If anyone from the public would like to make a comment or ask a question, please press star six to unmute yourself. Hello. Uh, my name is Emily and I'm a community member from North Minneapolis. And I actually have a question about the field training officer. Um, if you have open incident reports currently, are you able to be a field training officer? Is that being investigated also? Um, if your incidents are increasing, like say for instance, you have four incidents this year, last year you had three, the year prior year you had two, is that also being looked at as well? Thank you for the question and that is a good question. And yes, they are open incidents are being uh, critiqued and evaluated on both an individual, um, as an individual incident and then as a whole. Um, in that person's history and it really is the nature of the incident. Typically when something is open, they're not field training officers, but that's not an absolute. Someone may have, for instance, you know, um, an incident where a mistake was made or something was forgotten, where there wasn't an intent or, or something um, very serious. That individual may be allowed to train. Again, it is at the discretion of the chief or designee. Thank you, that was an excellent question. Mm -hmm. Would anyone else from the public like to ask a question or make a comment? Please press star six, star six to unmute. Uh, I don't hear anyone unmuting, so I'm going to recognize myself, Chair Sarah, to ask a question of Commander Horn. Is there a list of new reforms, or is that sort of forthcoming? Is that with the chief something that we could look at and and, and review? Sure. Uh, the the report with the audit committee is um, we report back to them periodically, and I imagine that after the first of the year we'll have some more information to be provided. I'll be more than happy to share that with you as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Does any other commissioner or member of the public have any questions or comments for Commander Horn? Hearing none, uh, thank you so much for being here, Commander Horn. We really appreciate your engagement and, and these discussions are really helpful to us and uh, moving forward. So uh, you're welcome to drop. We may have some further discussion. Just up to you what you'd like to do. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very much for the opportunity, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Okay, addressing the commission. Commissioners, any reactions, thoughts, further discussion, motions on the field training officer uh, presentation? I'll recognize myself, Chair Sarah. Um, it sounds like from Com what M Commander Horn uh, said is that this is an sort of an open process, an open research and study with the 
audit division, not our audit subcommittee, but the audit division within the city. I don't want to duplicate work or you know, kind of unnecessarily duplicate efforts. Um, so I nothing is jumping out at me as an action that this commission needs to take apart from perhaps requesting a follow up or requesting an update. Does any I see people nodding their heads, but you know, is there any comment on that? <laughs> this is Commissioner McGuire. Just I agree that I think it's something that we need to revisit. Um, especially when those manuals become available or more information becomes available. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Sparks. Uh, yeah, I feel exactly the same way. It would be great to get that update when that information is available and keep up on it. Excellent. Great. Well, what a commitment I can make is, you know, chair and leadership, excuse me, is I can just reach out to Commander Horn, who's been very, you know, gracious with her time. And um, I could just send her an email periodically and request for an update in the future. And perhaps in the January or February meeting that would be available to us. Okay, without any further ado, losing my place. Uh, our next item is a discussion of misconduct investigations. Um, and specifically, uh, misconduct, uh, specifically the point I wanted to make as chair is that misconduct investigations of Minneapolis police officers and when that officer leaves the department. Now, the officer could leave the department by Retiring, quitting, passing away. I mean, you know, like whatever reason the officer leaves the department, if the officer is in the department, uh, the investigation ends, even if the officer just goes to St. Paul or whatever, <laughs> you know, something like that. So uh, I wanted to put that um, on the agenda to discuss and sort of at the 11th hour, we were able to get the complaint process manual. And so the page that this policy appears on is page eight of the manual. It's letter H and it says cleared by exception and that and that states that um, an investigation is closed when the officer leaves and I will just share some of my concerns and then open it up for discussion. My concern is that um, just because an officer leaves the department, I think there would still be benefit in continuing the investigation and making whatever findings there are to be made. Um, and that is because if the officer has in fact committed some sort of misconduct, I think there should be a finding of misconduct and a record of it in case that officer were to return to the Minneapolis Police Department or if that officer joins a different law enforcement agency, I think that information would be relevant to the next agency. Or if the officer um, takes a medical leave and, le and leaves the department but then comes back or if the officer makes a claim of PTSD, perhaps the finding of misconduct would be. This is a perhaps right, you know, used to disprove a finding of PTSD. Um, you know, there's a lot of legal implications that would arise from some sort of finding of misconduct. This is only to say if there were a finding of misconduct, I'm only saying continue the investigation. I'm not saying that every investigation would, of course, result in the same finding. Um, Anyhow, I wanted to bring that to the attention of the group, and since it is a simple policy uh, within the OPCR, I think that is something that this group could talk about and make recommendations about if we thought it was appropriate. So opening the floor to discussion, would any commissioner like to offer thoughts or comments on that point? Uh, so Commissioner uh, Vice Chair Sparks, um, I did have a question on this, and I'm sorry if you covered this earlier, but um, so uh, it, it says uh, the, the text is uh, complaints may be cleared um, when the officer no longer work, works for MPD. Do we know how often that's happening? Is there like a percentage? Um, is this a matter of course, like as soon as an officer no longer works for MPD, all investigations stop or what, is, what does that look like in, in the real world? Do we know? Um, my understanding is in the real world, it's 100% of the time an officer leaves for any reason that investigation is just ended. It's a hard stop and that's come up in totally like many different contexts and many different discussions over the course of the PCOC. 
it's in this uh, OPCR ma uh, complaint manual. I th I think it isn't within internal affairs policy as well because that's how it was presented to me verbally. But I don't I don't have access to certain internal affairs documents. But I believe it exists within internal affairs as well. Um, you know, and I can see the logic of it to some extent. It's like, well, if the officer is not here, why waste resources? Why waste the resources? Um, you know, I see that. But, you know, what <laughs> we do have a community member, Mr. Turchik, who's constantly asking us questions. What lessons have we learned? Um, and if, if we consider a very recent case of Mr. Jaleel Stallings, one lesson we learned is that uh, three officers whose body camera videos showed egregious misconduct left the department before any finding could, you know, before the investigation was concluded or any finding could be made as to misconduct, even though we could all see it on this body camera video, right? So there isn't the documentation, there wasn't that finding. Um, and it's, you know, those officers could come back, they could join other law enforcement agencies. Um, you know, that is some, that is what, that was so shocking to me that that's what inspired me to put it on the agenda. Um, I think it's an important lesson and an important takeaway from what happened this past summer. Yeah, it really seems like if, if that's how it's being applied, that's sort of this uh, automatic out. If you if you happen to do something wrong, there's the easy answer. You can leave and maybe go work for someone else and maybe it sounds like you won't face any consequences. Oh, and I did want to say one more thing. Um, it's possible for an officer to leave um, but that officer would still have criminal investigations open. And so the officer could come back to court and testify. And just say, you know, I retired on such and such date, but I did this and you know, I made this arrest on this date and then I retired. So that would be an additional reason why. Theoretically, having that investigation complete would be important because that officer could still testify in court, even if he or she had left the department. And yeah, that's a good point too, because that um what they testify to if there's nothing on the other end uh, backing it up, you know, through the investigation. Well, who's to say if that's if that testimony is accurate or not, or you know, there's all sorts of implications there. I could right. see. Right. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Agree. Um, I'm going to open it up to the public. Uh, if anyone from the public would like to make a comment or question, please press star six to unmute yourself. Please press star six to unmute yourself. If anyone from the public would like to make a comment, please press star six to unmute yourself. And if anyone from the commission would like to make a comment, just. This is James Van Sloan. I just want to make a, a comment uh, on this as well. Um, I think it's also critical that you do not close the investigations uh, just so you can uh, take your own lessons learned. So if misconduct occurred and it's never investigated, it will be that much more difficult to prevent it happening in the future if you don't know it happened or how it happened or why it happened. Um, if you continue the investigation and, and until it's concluded, then you can actually uh, make adjustments to policy and procedure and training and so on to prevent it from happening in the future. So it is critical um, regardless of the officer's um, uh, results, but the, for the department to continue to improve. That's an excellent point, Mr. Van Sloan. Thank you for offering that. Anyone else? Comment, question, star six to unmute yourself. Commissioners, raise your hand. OK, I'm not hearing any other uh, discussion. I would like to make a motion to the commission. I'd like to make a motion that the PCOC recommend to the mayor and the police department and the OPCR to uh, continue any investigation, excuse me, to continue misconduct investigations, even if an officer leaves the department for any reason. Any discussion or thoughts on that motion? Okay, um, hearing no discussion or thoughts on the motion, I believe it's ready to be called. Would the clerk please call the roll on that on that motion?
Madam Chair, I think we'll need Sorry, a second on the Sorry, I was first. unmuted. Oh, uh, Mr. Fussy, did you want to be recognized? Yes, thank you. I don't know if I heard a second on the motion. It would require a second. Oh, beg your pardon. Uh, <clears throat> commission, uh, I made the motion. Would any commissioner second the motion? I'll, uh, Commissioner Sparks, I'll second it. Thank you. The motion is seconded uh, by Commissioner Sparks. Would the clerk please call roll? Commissioner McGuire. Aye. Commissioner Sylvester. Aye. Vice Chair Sparks. Aye. Chair Sarah. Aye. There are four ayes. Thank you. That motion does carry. And as chair, I will make that recommendation to the mayor, the MPD and OPCR. Thank you for that discussion. Our next item is a discussion of the Jones Day contract with the city of Minneapolis. Um, I put this on the agenda. We did discuss it last month, but after after we discussed it last month, I did receive one additional piece of documentation, which is included in today's agenda. And that particular piece of documentation uh, indicated that Jones Day, in addition to doing like litigation support and uh, courtroom defense, that kind of thing, is also doing tasks that I would uh, classify as PCOC tasks such as engaging public stakeholders, proactive discussion of police reforms, uh, and that kind of thing, which is squarely within the mission of the PCOC. So I thought it would be important to bring that up to the commission. Um, and I did have an additional question. Uh, the city's charter does say that the city attorney is the exclusive legal voice for the city, the ex you know, the exclusive entity that can provide legal advice to the city. So I just have a question about how Jones Day, you know, how 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 can the city sort of contract with Jones Day in this way for litigation support and um, uh, public support and that kind of thing. So I'd like to open up for discussion and not to put you on the spot, Mr. Fussy, but if you had any insight into that legal piece, uh, we'd welcome your comment as well. Uh Thank you, Chair Chair Sarah. I personally am not uh, intimately involved with uh, any of the Jones Day contracts or any of the numerous other contracts that their city employs with outside uh, legal counsel, but it is common practice to uh, engage outside legal counsel. Okay. Um, one uh, one tool we have at our in our operating rules is that we as a commission can sort of certify questions, if you will, to the city as attorney city attorney's office. So if this group had a wanted to have a very thorough legal response, we could request like a legal memorandum or a legal response from the city attorney's office on this point. Um, I have been asking some questions of OPR staff and Jones Day attorneys and so forth. And my understanding is that uh, the city attorney um, it wasn't staffed at a level to handle some of these, you know, some of this litigation and that the OPCR had a significant backlog of complaints. And so uh, basically staffing was one reason to request that Jones Day handle OPCR complaints um, and litigation support. I just like to offer my opinion is that we should be supporting OPCR and advocating for them to be staffed up. You know, if they need additional investigators, then I think the answer would be to hire additional investigators and not to have outside counsel for that. And then in terms of Jones Day doing PCOC work, that um, that seems contrary to the mission of the PCOC and contrary to the mission of civilian oversight, because of course we are a public entity, our meetings are public, we have to follow the open meeting laws rigorously uh, and so on, whereas an outside counsel, private law firm, that's 100% different. It's uh, attorney client privilege, confidential information, you know, that kind of thing. So it's certainly not public facing. Um, so those were some concerns I had. Did anyone else have any questions or concerns? As Vice Chair Sparks, I just wanted to mention to you that for all of the, um, I guess, additional or tertiary work for which Jones Day is uh, being engaged, the billable hours for that are extremely expensive for an outside law firm, especially one the size and scope and with the profit focus that Jones Day has. 
probably in the area of uh, several hundred dollars an hour. Um, it, I would seriously question if this is a good use of public money. It seems like a lot of fun, public funds are going to this, you know, all of our tax dollars. Um, and I would question if this is a, an appropriate use of that funds, uh, especially considering what Chair Sarah mentioned ago about if we're going to spend the money, maybe we staff up in those areas instead. That might be a better use of those dollars. I tend to agree, and it, it is a lot of dollars. I mean, I think that contract is pushing a million dollars, if I'm not mistaken, grand total. It's very, very expensive. And that's, of course, something we should all be concerned about, too. Thank you. I agree. Uh, I'll open up to the public. If anyone from the public or any commissioner would like to make a comment, please press star six to unmute yourself. Star six. Hi, uh, this is Dave Bicking. Um, yes, uh, thank you for bringing this up and particularly that uh, question regarding the charter. That's a very important question because I recall I don't have the exact language in front of me, but that Jones Day is the lead attorney in dealing with the Department of Justice investigation. That seems contrary to that charter position. Um, we and uh, Communities United Against Police Brutality has formed a working group to study um, what we're referring to as the privatization of police reform, really, um, through a number of areas. The most pressing is the Jones Day contract because of the many, many areas in which Jones Day is involved and because of the nature of the law firm, um, their past history, their involvement with, um, you know, Clients we wouldn't approve of, shall we say, um, including the Trump administration and election lawsuits and uh, um, others. Um, in general, we have taken the position that Jones Day should not be working for the city in any capacity. Um, clearly having them as investigators at the OPCR is very problematic. There's huge numbers of conflicts of interest, which the uh, contract just waives all conflicts of interest, and I believe waives any disclosure of the conflicts of interest. So um, this is an area important to us, and we're working with our coalition partners to um, press forward on this issue of basically getting rid of uh, Jones Day. So I very much appreciate the work the PCAC has done to get these contracts out. Um, and I hope you'll continue to look into this, and I think a legal opinion would be a, a, a good area to pursue in that respect, and uh, many others. So this is something I could talk about, you know, at another time too. I know you've got a long agenda tonight, so um, but thank you for bringing this up. Thank you. Recognize myself, Chair Sarah. Uh, thank you for bringing up conflicts of interest. Um, you know, one reason to hire outside counsel is if there is a conflict of interest and then the outside counsel can handle one aspect of it and the, the office can handle the other so that the conflict is avoided. It seems to me that this Jones Day contract is it encompasses so many different things. DOJ litigation, OPCR misconduct complaints, um, representing the city when officers are making disability claims that the contract itself is creating conflicts of interest rather than resolving or addressing a conflict of interest. So thank you for bringing that to our attention, Mr. Bicking. Does anyone else have any comment or question? Star six to unmute yourself or commissioners, please raise your hand. Um, I'd like to make one further comment. Uh, this is Chair Sarah. Um, once uh, Vice Chair Sparks and I received that additional document that let us know that Jones Day was doing essentially PCOC work. Um, I did request a follow up meeting because that was not discussed in, our, in the meeting we did have. Um, and I just wanted to know sort of how that's working, how we can work together, you know, what we can do moving forward. And uh, Jones Day and a city attorney weren't willing to meet. Uh, for three more months. They want to meet quarterly and they weren't willing to grant another meeting before our next quarterly meeting three months out. I did invite either Jones Day or the city attorney, whoever wished to make 
um, a presentation on this agenda item and no one was available to do so. So, you know, I have a level of frustration. I felt like this was being hidden from us. I made a data practices request. That piece was like a full page redaction. Um, it wasn't until I sort of pushed back on that and said there isn't a basis to to redact that information that I finally got that document. And then when I requested discussion of that piece, um, we're being pushed even further back three months out. And I will note that when uh, the city attorney originally asked council to engage Jones Day, city council uh, approved that, made that request, but city council also issued a staff direction that Jones Day and the city attorney must communicate with the PCOC in order to ensure a level of you know public transparency and so on. That was in December of last year, so that's been a full year and we've had one 30 minute meeting. And even that meeting we weren't <laughs> we didn't have the full scope of of the work, so uh, I'll, I'll point I'm out feeling too, frustrated. Yeah, I wanted to point out to you. I'm, I'm sorry, Chair Sarah. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but that meeting was at uh, at our behest. It was our request to have that meeting. It was not something um, brought to us by City Attorney's Officer Jones Day. It was, it, it was uh, uh, spun up by by our work or really your work. I believe Director. Gillespie has a hand raised. If that's correct, uh, Director Gillespie, I recognize you. Thank you, Chair. I I did want to I wanted to do my little research before I commented. I, I back to the issue regarding costs. I do know a lot of the work that Jones Day is doing is pro bono, so that's a great concern. And I just wanted to share that information. Um, and I don't have any other information, on, particularly on that contract, to share. But I do know because I have asked that question. It, it's it's pro bono, so. Thank you, Director Gillespie. Um, I believe that uh, it is pro bono. It's, it's a mix of pro bono and paid. I believe it's a million dollar contract and then any services rendered, you know, above that uh, would be donated pro bono to the city. So That's it's, cool. yeah, so it's, it is a mix. Um, and, and one thing I'd be interested in following up with you, and I realize you only have four weeks as director, but um, you know, we want to partner. One thing we can do as PCOC, one of our mission statements is to advocate for staffing for the Civil Rights Department or the OPCR when when needed. And so if there were a if you could say like we need two investigators and one intake officer or whatever you might say, that would be valuable information for us in terms of our advocacy to um, council and the mayor. That's excellent. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. Um, does anyone else have any discussion or comments? Um, is anyone interested in asking that legal question of the city attorney and requesting a legal response, at least on that charter piece? Uh, I'd be interested in their response, you know, just me personally. My, uh, this is sorry, Commissioner McGuire. My only concern is timing, although it doesn't seem to matter. I was just hoping that if we could get additional meetings, we might get answers more quickly because I don't know how long a written response takes. But at this point, that might not be there might not be a difference in the timing of a sort of a meeting. Yeah, uh, that's a good point, Commissioner McGuire, and I, I honestly don't know the I, I don't know the answer to that. So. Um. Well, what I would like to do is chair. Uh, so I guess I'll make a motion. I would like as chair to bring that particular. Oh, I, uh, Mr. Fussy, I recognize Mr. Fussy. Thank you, Chair Sarah and Commissioners. Um, certainly, I can attempt to provide uh, a response that's uh, written out, but I I don't want to get any put any uh, false pretenses out there. The answer is very clear that. The city attorney has the power to hire deputy city attorneys, assistant city attorneys, outside counsel, and to coordinate and to marshal the forces regarding the litigation and legal services uh, provided to the city. And that's what's happening here. We have a long history. It's completely um, a model that's used in many other cities of engaging with outside counsel. And that is in full compartment with uh, the charter. And that's essentially what any opinion would say. But if you want, uh, that in more explicit written detail, we can certainly do that. 
OK, uh, thank you for that, Mr. Fussy, and I certainly don't want to. Ask unnecessary questions or create unnecessary work, uh, not not at all. It just the the charter as written seems so clear. <laughs> you know, it just says the city attorney is the sole legal advisor of, of the mayor and. The, yeah, and I know that there is a history of outside counsel, so I'm just wondering kind of how that works. Do you think, Mr. Fussy, there would be a value in just like explaining how it works to us just so we would have that knowledge? Or do you think that would just simply be like, you know, just a waste? Well, there there <laughs> certainly is, and I'm sorry for jumping in, uh, Chair Sarah, there Please certainly do. is a, a more formal process that is established. Again, I'm not involved with it uh, very often, but there is a pretty formal process in our office uh, with regards to um, engaging outside counsel, and I think that could be outlined uh, pretty, you know, and provide maybe some value to you. Thank you. That that actually, I I would like to know that. Um, commissioners, anyone else? Does anyone? How does anyone else feel about Mr. Uh, Fussy's comments? It's Commissioner McGuire. I think I would also, if there's an outline we could use that would be helpful, especially when we're looking at the potential activities that Jones Day is participating in. Um, it might lead to further questions um, for us or just kind of better inform us. It would be really helpful. Thank you. So Mr. Fussy, uh, apologies putting you on the spot yet again. Do I need to make a motion for that or since it's in our operating rules, can I simply just ask you <laughs> for that information? What is the I matter? think the ask has been made and I'll, I'll commit okay. to providing that information. OK, thank you so much, Mr. Fussy. I really appreciate it. Um, any further comment? I don't have any motions other than a commitment to work with Director Gillespie. And if there's any staffing recommendations, I would bring that back to this group for further discussion. OK, um, our next item is a discussion of Mayor Fry's public safety work group, uh, which is um, been convened very recently and just today I learned that the uh, the co-chair of the work group is Ms. Or attorney Nikimi Le Levy Armstrong and I did send her an email just kind of letting her know I exist and inviting um, you know inviting communication but I only sent that this afternoon so uh, she hasn't had a chance to respond to me or do anything like that uh, just letting you know that I made that connection or I attempted to make that connection and I hope that I would be able to communicate uh, with the chair going forward. Um, the reason I put this on the agenda is because <clears throat> from what I understand from the press release and a few other related coverage is it sounds like the work group would do a lot of the work that the PCOC is tasked with doing, which is making research based recommendations to the mayor regarding public safety, which is squarely within our mission. Um, Personally, I see no reason for our our groups to be at odds, and I see every reason for our groups to work together when possible and to communicate with each other. Um, I had an idea that maybe uh, pending discussion, we could ask the mayor to make a spot on the work group for a liaison from the PCOC, and my idea that 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 would be a leadership position within the PCOC. So we would have a chair, a vice chair, and a liaison to the work group just so that communication could happen between the two groups. And, you know, there would be presentations at future PCOC meetings and so on. Um, one difference between a work group and a, a board or a commission, the board or commission is subject to open meeting law. We are a public entity. Everything we do is public. We have to have, if we talk about a document, we have to append it to our agenda, all that kind of stuff whereas a work group doesn't have to meet in public and probably won't or won't most of the time and doesn't have that uh, data disclosure requirement. Um, and are our, our the PCOC pursuant to the ordinance, we specifically must engage the public and invite public comment and that's part of our mission, whereas the work group doesn't have that mission. But I would imagine that the work group would start meeting and doing its work and it, there may come a time where they'd say, OK, we have this idea and we'd love to hear what the community thinks about it. And perhaps that would be a moment when they would choose to make a presentation to the PCOC, for example. Uh, I'm just thinking of ways that the two groups could sort of complement each other rather than kind of work, <laughs> you know, silently alongside of each other. So I'm going to open the floor, uh, commissioners. Um, any any comments or thoughts 
about the mayor's working group that you'd like to share? Commissioner Sylvester. Um, thank you so much. I think it's valuable um, to have as many voices as possible um, in this discussion. Um, I love the idea of reaching out and trying to establish uh, a like an official connection. I think that's a wonderful idea. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm excited to see how that relationship grows. Thank you. I'm going to also open it up for public comment. Please press star six to unmute yourself, star six to unmute, or uh, commissioners raise your hand if there's any further comment or question. No further comment or question. Um, well, then I would like to make uh, a motion for this commission to recommend or requ excuse me, rec request of the mayor to uh, to make a spot for the PCOC or a PCOC representative on the work group to enhance communication between those two groups and to kind of bridge the, the two entities. And I welcome discussion on that point or that motion rather. Any discussion? Um, I, I would I wanted to offer one more thought last summer when the mayor had a few working groups that were kind of like this, but a little bit different. Uh, there was a spot for the PCOC on the working group at that time, um, and at that time it was the chair of the PCOC who was tasked with going to the meetings. I don't have an opinion about who should be going to the meetings. I think it should be someone else, so we kind of share the wealth of meetings, but you know, that's just me. Um, so there's precedent for this. OK, hearing no further discussion, um, would anyone second the motion? Ms. Commissioner McGuire, I second the motion. Thank you. Would the clerk please call roll on the motion? Commissioner McGuire. Aye. Commissioner Sylvester. Aye. Vice Chair Sparks. Aye. Chair Sarah. Aye. There are four ayes. That motion carries and I will make a recommendation to the mayor, uh, or excuse me, or, or make a request to the mayor to add PCOC or a spot for the PCOC on his working group. OK, our next item of is a discussion of legal research from the Minnesota Justice Foundation and uh, I believe Commissioner McGuire uh, would like to uh, discuss that. So Commissioner McGuire, please. Thank you, uh, Chair Sarah. So the question, uh, just to give a little background, the Minnesota Justice Foundation is a nonprofit that does a variety. I probably don't know the full scope of everything that they do, but one of the things they do is provide uh, opportunities for law students to volunteer for different either nonprofits entities in Minnesota um, to provide their services. And one of those, one a common way of doing that for law students is to perform legal research. Um, and so they had approached PCOC about um, engaging a volunteer law student to do any type of research really, um, or any sort of project for the PCOC. Um, I think we discussed research because or just touched on research because that is an easy way especially during a pandemic for a law student to provide support to a group like the PCOC and has I believe law students have helped um, do research for the PCOC in the past and so we were looking um, I was wondering if wanted to propose ways to engage a law student from MJF the Minnesota Justice Foundation um, I think a good point chair Sarah brought up um, previously is that just to ensure that we can do that. So that might be a question for attorney, city attorney Fussy, uh, Mr. Fussy, if we can ask a law student to do legal research, if there would be any issues with making that ask. And then the second is what questions we would like to ask. So um, I'm just going to keep going real quick. Um, the questions, um, a question that 
Chair Sarah had brought up was the one that we were discussing earlier was, um, you know, the city contracting with Jones Day and outside entities. And a question I I had in mind, perhaps for the next year is now that we've had votes on um, restructuring what powers lie with the city council and the city, you know, might be moved over to the mayor's office. How will that affect the work of the PCOC? Who we report to? Um, kind of how does that that affects our work? Um, I thought that could be a legal research question that a law student could spend time looking at. Um, so I guess just you don't have to spend much time on it, uh, Mr. Fussy, but if there's any issues with asking a, a law student to do this research, please uh, let us know. Um, thank you, commissioners. That's probably a question I, I'd like to spend some time looking at. Um, it, it, it might be, uh, it's, it's a discussion I'd like to have with my office. I certainly don't want to cut anything off, but I want to make sure that we'd be doing anything in compliance with any of the policies that we have. Okay, I think in light of that answer, um, sorry to cut you off, Chair Sarah, if you're about to say something, I believe it would be, even if it is a volunteer opportunity, that might not start until the next semester or the next year. So I don't know if we want to wait for the city attorney's response before we formulate those questions. Um, I don't know if anyone has any thoughts. I think I'd like to hear the city attorney's response just because I don't want to, you know, yeah, waste some time. And if I could jump in once again, if Commissioner McGuire, if you could do me a favor and kind of send over the, I guess proposal might not be the correct term, but all of the details that you could, um, and I could hopefully find, see what the best uh, way forward would be on that. Thank you. I will do that. Thank you both. Um, did anyone else have any comments or questions for uh, Commissioner McGuire regarding the MJF? potential project. Thank you so much for bringing that up, uh, Commissioner McGuire. It's a really great addition. OK, um, we will next take up reports. I recognize Vice Chair Sparks, I believe, who will present the audit subcommittee report if he's ready. I am ready. OK, so um, uh, our audit subcommittee meeting, the last one took place uh, November 22nd. Um, it was, I seem to remember it being a rather short meeting. Um, the coaching study of the work is sort of still ongoing to get the foundations together. We're um, being stifled by ongoing litigation. Um, and I think the cutoff that for our research and studies, I believe it's complaints and discipline up to 2017, if I'm not mistaken. And that's just kind of what we're going with. Um, but it's just been slow going. Um, the information is in disparate areas. Um, it's spread out. It's difficult to get access to. The different systems don't really match up in an easy way. So it's been um, uh, a lot of, uh, it's a heavy lift on the city staff who's been working on that. So it's, uh, it's still going. Um, I think on our our future meeting, we were going to invite council to um, discuss some questions that we had on uh, the arbitration process, and we were beginning to take a look at uh, the discipline process and how we could study disparate outcomes. Um, and then we are still waiting for an update on the uh, uh, the, this was a study that started a long time ago. It was about um, MPD interactions with uh, members of the, uh, the trans community. Um, there is a member of, uh, I keep forgetting her name and I feel so embarrassed that I do that, but uh, she's, I believe she's back from leave, but we still need an update from her. Um, and that hopefully will be forthcoming. Thank you. Any questions for Vice Chair Sparks regarding the audit subcommittee update? Thank you for pinch hitting Commissioner Sp or Vice Chair Sparks. With that uh, and without objection, I will direct the clerk to receive and file his report. And next I will recognize Vice Chair Sparks again <laughs> to give a Vice Chair update if you would please. Sure, um, so I can just give an update on some of uh, our recent 
activities. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, a couple of weeks ago, I did the HCMC ride along. Um, Dr. Nicholas Simpson, who was with us earlier in the evening, was my uh, cohort and guide for that ride along. Um, it was a four plus hour um, experience. Um, I think, as I mentioned earlier, probably not real eloquently, um, it was very eye opening for me to see the coordination between different services, um, the real world sort of uh, situations that people address, how you interact with people in the community, um, the quick decision making. Um, I saw somebody, you know, we were first on the scene on a bad car accident and uh, there was somebody there who I'm absolutely certain had their life saved by uh, Dr. Simpson. So. Uh, that was very, very uh, uh, eye-opening and crazy to see. Not, uh, I would try to go in without a lot of expectations, um, just keep an open mind, and it was very, very illuminating. And I have a newfound respect for everybody who works in, uh, in EMS and, and fire and police uh, based on my experiences. So if um, you have the opportunity, which we do, and the time, I would highly, highly recommend that uh, uh, my fellow commissioners try to uh, take advantage of it because it is, it is really... It's, it's something else. What can I say? Um, Chair Sarah and I, Sarah and I also had uh, a meeting with um, Cheryl Schmidt, who is the Federation, the Police Federation president. Um, I mean, it was a good meeting. It's productive. Um, she's very gracious with her time. She was forthcoming. She indicated a willingness to uh, meet with us in the future, you know, on an ongoing basis, and to uh, to join these meetings and possibly provide um, presentations, updates, that sort of thing. So I think it was a good first step in in that relationship, and hopefully that's something we can continue to grow as we um, move forward with here. Um, and I also had a quick update on. The, uh, the question of stipends, I think a few people have had mentioned that we were having issues with the, uh, the stipends coming from the city, and I, it's something I've been trying to work on with various departments, members of city staff, uh, accounts payable, and so forth, and basically I don't have any updates. It's an ongoing issue that I have not been able to get anyone to look into in a real way or talk to me about, but still trying. Uh, that's disappointing. <laughs> I mean, I, I, yeah. Thank you for trying, uh, Vice Chair Sparks. Um, it seems like that should that information should be readily available. Seems like it should be. What can I say? You reach out, you call, you email. Brick wall every time. So far. Well, thank you for doing that heavy lift. I didn't mean to cut you off. Did you have any additional reports? No, you came in at exactly the right time. I, unless I forgot something, I don't believe I have any additional reports. Very good. I'll, I'll recognize myself to make chair updates. Um, I had all those meetings uh, that Vice Chair Sparks mentioned. Um, I also had a pleasant meet and greet with Director Gillespie. It was it was very quick. She'd only just been hired, but um, it, you know, just the fact that she wants to be at this meeting and to ask questions and to participate. I, you know, I welcome with open arms and I'm really excited about that working relationship moving forward. Um, and I think I speak for the whole commission when I say welcome to the director. Um, I have no update on future appointees to this commission, either reappointments or new appointments. Um, I have asked for that information. Um, I, I uh, the OPCR staff, I believe, is in training and they weren't available to attend the meeting today. So. Um, I don't have an update, We're we're down three commissioners since uh, August, I think, and two of us, um, our commission ends this month. So we're about to be down five commissioners are very close to it, uh, so. If OPCR is uh, listening, I hope, that, I hope that there will be some appointments uh, forthcoming just so we can maintain our quorum and continue to do our good work. Um, any questions from the commissioners for either Vice Chair Sparks or myself? Uh, with that and without objection, I will direct the clerk to receive and file this report. Thank you very much. 
The next order of business is the acceptance of general public comments. I will open the floor and invite public comments from the community. We will limit the comment period to no more than two minutes per speaker, and this can be on any topic, not uh, just what we discussed tonight. With that, are there any community members on the line who wish to address the commission? Please press star six to unmute yourself, star six. Hi, this is Dave Picking again, and I would like to make a general comment, and I appreciate your openness to comments today. And also the uh, long and very interesting agenda that's been put together. And again, I appreciate very much the links that come with those. I'll be looking at a number of those. Um, when I commented about Jones Day, one thing I forgot to say is that it's pushing the public out of police reform efforts or any uh, participation in the decision making or even research um, regarding police reform. That's this is what led to us uh, forming a privatization working group to begin with within CUAPB, is that um, when these outside firms come in like this, it pushes out the public. It's also noticeable that it's uh, pushing out the PCOC. Um, this is uh, something that's happened a number of times in the past of your organization, that the PCOC is not included in the discussions that it's supposed to be, or sometimes even discussions that it's promised to be. Um, and now it's the PCOC was totally left out of that mayor's uh, working group on public safety. That's simply unacceptable, and it is a, a disservice to the public, and it's a disservice to your um, commission. Um, and also, as you note, they have they closed the um, applications for the PCO on October 22nd. There have been no appointments made. So far as I know, there have been no interviews done. Certainly those who uh, applied and haven't gotten an interview, haven't gotten any other response yet to say why they're not getting an interview. It's uh, now impossible with the council schedule for there to be new members for the uh, January um, meeting of the PCOC. And again, this has been a pattern too many years of the PCOC being kept weak and ineffective by simply not appointing people to it. Uh, talk about passive aggressive, I guess. Um, this is, uh, again, unacceptable. Thank you for your work. Thank you, Mr. Bicking, and thanks for your continued engagement. Anyone else from the public? Please press star six, star six to unmute yourself. Going once, going twice, star six to unmute yourself. OK, I want to thank all our speakers for their comments tonight. And with that, we've concluded all items on our agenda for this meeting. I declare this meeting adjourned and I'll see everyone back here. Well, uh, I hope I'll see everyone back here next month for the January 11th regular meeting if we have uh, enough members to make quorum. Seeing no further business to come before us and without objection, I will declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you everyone and good night. Thank you everyone. Great, great meeting. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.